right, how about uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7 tonight as we find ourselves right here in the midst of studying the life of David. Now, one of the things that we could say, one of the positive things about David is that he was one of these types of guys that success really never ruined him. Success Success always poses a danger to us. I'm sure that many of us have known individuals that they've, they've come into money, they've come into position, they've come into authority, and they misunderstand the source of that position, the source of that money. They attribute the success to themselves, to their own wisdom, to their own work ethic. When the Bible tells us that whatever we have in our life has been has come into our life through the Lord. What do you have that God did not give you? And if it is the Lord that has given you that, what are you doing boasting in it? So that in the blessing and in the prosperity, in the success, we make our boast in God, not in ourselves. And it seems that David really had his feet firmly planted on the ground when it came to that issue. He never misunderstood the source of blessing in his life. And he is living now in a season of his life where he is cruising on every horizon. There is success coming his way. Everything is on the the upside for this man. And again, heaven uh, holds its breath. Uh, when a saint of God experiences success, because you just, you just never know where they're going to go with this. Is it going to ruin them? Is it going to bring harm uh, to them? Now, here is David. He is living in the midst of incredible prosperity. He's living with, with more money and more success than he's ever had in his life. And you remember the last time we were together that he brought in the Ark of the Covenant. You remember the Ark of the Covenant earlier, and this was in our study in 1 Samuel, that Eli allowed the Ark of the Covenant to be taken into battle. Israel was treating God like a, like a, a lucky rabbit's foot. Israel was treating God like he was their good luck charm. And they were taking the Ark of the Covenant into battle. And of course, it didn't work, and God doesn't honor that. And he allowed... Israel to experience defeat, and the Philistines ran off with the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, it's a bad day when the enemy runs off with your God. And you remember that everywhere the Ark went, there was was just heartache. There was just pain. And these dumb Philistines quickly realized, hey, you know what? I think our string of bad luck is because we've got that that Ark. Let's let's send that back uh, to to the Jews. And you remember they sent it back. Now, it ended up in some guy's pole barn, and it was there for a lot of years. And so David now comes to uh, the kingship, he comes to the throne, and he wants the presence of God right there in the heart of the capital city. Now, it wasn't in the tabernacle, because the tabernacle had been destroyed. You remember that the Philistines, after they stole the Ark of the Covenant, they then had a further incursion into Israel, and they destroyed the city of Shiloh. And Shiloh is where the Ark of God was at. So there is no tabernacle. And apparently, David now has set up a small tent-like system of some kind there in the city of Jerusalem. Now, you remember, this becomes Jeremiah's basis of his rebuke of Israel, because at the time of Jeremiah, the Babylonians were gathering. God was going to use the Babylonians to judge his people. There were false prophets in the city of Jerusalem saying, no, God will never judge Jerusalem. We've got the temple of the Lord. And Jeremiah was saying, hey, don't you run around saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Don't you think that that building is going to somehow keep you from experiencing God's judgment? God and the message of Jeremiah is that God will burn down whatever he has to burn down in our life to get our attention. And if he has to burn down your beautiful church building, he'll do it. Because he would rather you be in a right relationship with him than be deceived by the religious trappings that you think make you holy. 
And so Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter seven, the Lord speaking through him said, go to my place in Shiloh where I first caused my name to dwell and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. Don't say you've got the temple of the Lord. You take this little field trip, you go there to, to Shiloh and what do you find? You will find my tabernacle has been destroyed. And a couple of verses later, he says, I shall do to the house which bears my name in which you trust and to the place which I have, uh, I gave you and your ancestors just as I did uh, to Shiloh. So the tabernacle's been destroyed. So David can't take it back to the tabernacle. So now it's sitting in a tent on some street in the city of Jerusalem. And so as David now surveys all that is his and all the blessings that he experience, uh, ex- is experiencing, uh, there's one thing that bugs him. And uh, the one thing that bugs him is a good thing. It's an honorable thing. Now let's notice what it is. In verse one, we read, now it came to pass, when the king was dwelling in his house, that the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies round about. And the king said unto Nathan the prophet, see now that I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God, it dwells inside tent curtains. Now he's probably a little embarrassed by this situation. You remember that Hiram, who was the king of Tyre, had sent these massive uh, cedar trees down from Lebanon. And he also sent stonemasons, and he sent carpenters. He sent artisans down to Jerusalem with, with all of, of this raw material. And they built David a cedar palace. And you can imagine the beauty. Of, what did that have to smell like? Imagine living in a cedar palace. And so here's David, and he is walking through this incredible mansion, this palace of cedar that God has given him. And then he'd look out his window and he'd see God living in a tent. And he's thinking to himself, now look, if God is God and David is honoring him as God, you can see how there would almost be a sense of embarrassment Almost a a, a sense of what in the world am I doing? Why am I living in the midst of all of this splendor and this beauty and we've got God out there living in a tent? And I I think that it was probably gnawing at him. I mean, imagine you, you live in a mansion. Imagine you live in this gorgeous mansion. You got a friend from out of town, a good friend, and he and his family's coming for the weekend to visit you, and you greet them at your front door, and you escort them to your backyard where you got a tent set up for them. And you're living in the mansion, and your good buddy is living in a tent. You wouldn't do that. You'd be mortified to do such a thing. You'd be so embarrassed. Well, imagine if the good friend showing up was God, right? And now you got God living in a tent. So this is where David is at. He's thinking to, he's thinking to, uh, to himself, this is not right. And so now he's got the holy man. He's got Nathan the prophet there. And he says to Nathan, I'm going to build God a house. And you think about it. Well, that's, that's a good thing, right? That's not a bad thing. That's not an evil thing. You recognize that I'm an earthly king and I'm living in this glorious mansion. Why is the king of kings still living in a tent? Well, we want to give him an upgrade and I'm going to build him, uh, going to build him a house. Now, what is Nathan going to say to such a thing? Notice verse three. And then Nathan said to the king, Go and do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Now, his response, it, it makes sense, does it not? It's, it's understandable. Imagine if somebody said to you, imagine you've got a friend, 
incredibly wealthy, more, more money than they, they know what to do with. They are attending a church that's just busting at the seams. And they say to you one day, you know, our church really needs a, a, a new place to meet. I, you know, I got all of this money and what am I going to do with this? And so I'm, I'm thinking that maybe I'll just buy my church uh, a new building. Now, what are you going to say in response to that? Oh, that's a stupid idea. That's the dumbest thing I've ever... No, you're thinking, well, I mean, the guy's got money. The guy wants to do it. This is a good thing. I mean, why in the world would I tell anybody no, right? It seems like a no-brainer. But in this case, the answer from God was going to be no. You see, this is an example of a good guy. Nathan's a good guy. And he's hanging out with another good guy. And the one good guy's got a good idea. So the good guy says, yeah, that's a good idea. Why, why don't you do it? The problem is it's not the will of God. And this is why you and I have to, in all things, we've got to pray without ceasing. Here is an example of a man of God giving counsel that is contrary to the will of God. And he's giving counsel that is contrary to the will of God because he had not prayed about the counsel that he was given, giving. And so you and I, before we start shooting our mouths off and giving people counsel and, and telling people what they ought to be doing, before we give them our counsel, we ought to be praying, now, Lord, is this really what I need to be telling my brother? Is this really what I need to be telling uh, my sister here? Paul Apple, he puts it this way. Plans that sound good to us on the surface may not be God's will since his ways are not our ways. Discipline of waiting upon the Lord is essential. Nathan thought that this was a no-brainer and didn't bother to seek the Lord's counsel. And so the Lord now encounters Nathan a little bit later on in the day. And he says to Nathan, he says, now what did, what, what did you tell him that for? Why, why, why did you tell him uh, that, that he can build me a house? And he, and he says to Nathan, he says, did, did I ever, in the history of my relationship with my people, have I ever asked the people to build me a house? Have I ever complained that I didn't have a house? Did I ever say to, to my people, well, if you really love me, you'd really build me a nice house? No, I've never said anything like, what are you doing telling him that he can build me a house? No. Eventually, as the story will unfold, we're going to discover that the reason why David is limited here is because David is a man of war. David has killed both the guilty and the innocent. Uh, David's hands had a lot of blood on them. This temple would be a, a building that would speak of peace with God. It would be a place where people could find peace with God, find peace. And so it would seem a little bit hypocritical that a man of war would be building a house of peace. And so, no, I don't want David to build it. Now, it's interesting that the Lord says to Nathan, Nathan, you're going to have to go back and tell him no, right? I didn't tell him yes. You did. And so your words, you got to fix it. You know, sometimes the Lord makes us clean up our own mess. And the Lord is saying to Nathan, you're going to have to disappoint. I'm not going to disappoint him uh, because you're the one that kind of set this scenario up uh, in the first place. But just so David is not let down too hard, I'm going to give him some promises. And you tell David, he can't build me a house, but I'm going to be building him a house. Now, let's notice the four promises that God gives to David here. Let's notice in verse 9, first of all, the Lord says, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to give you a famous reputation. Uh, I'm, I'm going to build you up. You are going to be great, and the nations around you are going to know all about you. Notice in verse 10 that he says, I'm going to give 
a homeland uh, to Israel. Uh, my people are not going to be uh, vagabonds. My, my, my people are not going to be gypsies. I'm settling them here in the land. In verse 11, he says, I'm going to give you undisturbed rest. I'm going to give you victory uh, over your enemies. And as we make our way through the story of David, we're going to see it over and over, particularly next week. Uh, we're, we're going to see constant victory that God is giving to David. And then notice from verse 12 to verse 16, he says, I'm going to give you an everlasting royal dynasty. I'm going to give you a son, and this son is going to be over an everlasting uh, kingdom. Now, he's talking about, of course, in the short term, he's talking about Solomon but in the long term he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ the son of David Sidlow Baxter he makes this observation he says as in the Abrahamic covenant the promised seed was Isaac in the immediate sense and Christ in the ultimate sense. So in the Davidic covenant, the promised son is Solomon in the immediate sense and Christ in the ultimate sense. So as he talks about everlasting kingdom here, he's not talking about Solomon. He's looking way down the road to the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom that will have no end. So once again, as is frequently found in Old Testament prophecies, you have a near and a far fulfillment. You have an immediate fulfillment, but then you have this long range fulfillment, uh, speaking of something great that is happening in the future. Now notice that this is all based upon God's grace. Notice how in verse 10 we read, I will appoint. Verse 10, I will plant. Verse 11, uh, he, he will make you a house. Verse 12, I will set up. Verse 12, again, I will establish. Verse 13, I will establish the throne. Verse 14, I will be his father. Verse 14, I will chase. And notice over and over again, I, I, I. It's not saying, David, if you try hard, if you get a little bit, of, a little bit more effort, uh, wonderful things are gonna happen. No, this is something that I am going to do for you. Now imagine how this must have hit David. David, you're not gonna build me a house. I'm gonna build you a house, and this house is going to be an everlasting kingdom. It is gonna be a kingdom that will never come to an end. Now here you are, you're a shepherd boy, you come from very humble beginnings. You're the baby of the family. You've always been picked on by your other brothers. Even the holy man Samuel looked at them and thought outwardly they appeared to be kingly material. And then you, the runt of the litter, uh, you come in and you end up being the king. And now all of a sudden God is saying to you, I'm going to do something in your life that will never come to an end. And so notice now what David's response is to this in verse 18. And then King David, he went in and he sat before the Lord. How infrequently we do that. When was the last time that you sat before the Lord? No phone, no tablet, no, destruction, no, no, uh, no distraction, you went and you sat before the Lord and notice what he said, who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet, this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God, and you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come an everlasting kingdom. Is this the manner of men? Is this how men do things? No, what you are doing, God, is not what men do. Oh, Lord God, now what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. For your word's sake and according to your own heart, you have done all of these things and to make your servant know them. Now this is one of the most heartfelt and one of the most moving prayers in all of scripture. Now notice 10 times he refers to himself as Yahweh's servant. 
Notice eight times he calls God his master in this section. He calls him Adonai, which, which would be master. And what makes this so amazing is that this is in response to this man being told no. This gives us a little bit of insight into David's heart. Uh, I don't like to be told no. I, I doubt if you like to be told no either. Uh, and so the Lord has come to this. Now, this guy's got big dreams, right? This guy's got big aspirations. I'm going to build a house for God. And probably in the time that Nathan was away being scolded by God to go back and tell David he can't do it, I'm sure David was working on a knockout list, you know, okay, I'm going to need bunches of timber, and I'm going to need lots of gold, and I'm going to need this and that. And then all of a sudden, the guy that told you yes now comes back and say, you know what I said about saying, yeah, well, I got to take that back. Uh, God's not going to do it uh, or let you do it, but rather he's going to build you a house and and David now notice that in this prayer David sees two things and and this is critical uh, to worship notice that David sees who he is and he understands who God is and as long as we keep that difference in our minds we will offer to the Lord pure worship. In fact, the greater the distance that exists between who you think you are and who you think God is, the greater that distance is in your mind, uh, the more effectual worshiper you will be. Uh, Notice the words that David uses here. Notice he says, for your word's sake and your own heart and you have done all these things and your servant. Notice four times, uh, or in four verses, 11 times, he uses you and your I think a good exercise when we are evaluating our worship is to ask ourselves, how many times are we singing I and me and my and we and us, and how many times are we singing you and your? You see, worship reaches the zenith when we are not singing about God, which is fine, I mean, amazing grace. We're singing about God, right? And, and again, you know, we, we are to sing to ourselves psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know, we, we are to encourage ourselves with these kinds of songs. But worship really reaches its zenith when we are just bowing before God and we are praying and we are worshiping to him alone. Now, notice, he, he's now be, being made great. Now, when God makes you great, You know, do you see yourself as great or do you see him as great? Notice what David says in verse 22. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you. And then get a load of this. Nor is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. There is no God but you. Now, the Mormons... They've come up with a whole lot of gods. The Mormon church will tell you, oh, I mean, there's more gods than you can shake a stick at. There's there's just all kinds of gods. In fact, Joseph Smith, he said, in the beginning, the head of the gods called a council of the gods, and they came together and they concocted a plan to create the world and to people it. Orson Pratt, who was a, um, uh, an apostle in the Mormon church, said, if we should take a million of worlds like this and number their particles, we should find that there are more gods than there are particles of matter in the world. There's all kinds of gods. Now, where did all of these gods come from? Well, it might surprise you. Joseph Smith says, God himself was once as we are now, and is an exalted man, and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. You have got to learn how to be God yourself. Now, if this is not taking a page out of Satan's book, when he said to Eve, oh, I mean, look, God's just not wanting you to become a God like him. I mean, he's just trying to, you know, keep keep this whole God thing to himself. But you've got to learn to be God's yourself and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods 
have done before you. You see, you just need to learn to be a good little Mormon and do everything that Joe Smith told you to do, and if you'll do that, you will be exalted uh, to uh, a, a godlike uh, state. Now, who, who is uh, an example of this? Listen to what Brigham Young said. I tell you, when you see your father in the heavens, you will see Adam. And when you see your mother that bore your spirit, you will see Mother Eve. You see, Mormon theology teaches that Adam, that he was a good Mormon, and he was exalted to uh, being a god, and uh, he, he raised Eve uh, from the dead, and now Adam and Eve, they got their own little planet somewhere where they're having this uh, eternal celestial sex up there, and uh, the result of that is all of these little uh, spirit babies, and you were one of those little spirit babies, and now uh, you've been sent to this planet, and you've been given a body, and uh, so you be a faithful Mormon, and one day you're going to be able to have your planet, and you're going to be able to make your little spirit babies uh, as well. So when you and I pray, our Father in heaven, who do Mormons say that we are praying to? We are praying to Adam. Now, somebody is lying to you. Now, either David is lying, because David said, there is no God but you, or Mormonism is lying to you. Now, as for me and my house, we take a stand that Mormonism is lying to us. But you have got to make that choice yourself. Now, notice how this closes in verse 25. Now, O Lord, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you have said. So let your name be, be magnified forever, saying, the Lord of hosts is God over Israel. Let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. And now, Lord God, you are God and your words are true. And you have promised this goodness to your servant. Now, therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant that it may continue forever before you for you O Lord God have spoken it and with your blessing let the house of your servant be blessed forever and so David David is saying yes Lord yes if this is your will oh father yes bless my house how often how often do you pray for the Lord's blessing on you and on your house. How often do you pray the promises of God? Do you ever go through the word of God and see all of the promises that he has made to you? And do you pray those promises? Here's David being given a great promise. What's he doing? Yes, God, yes, amen. Bring that right. That sounds great to me. You want to build me a house, God? Knock yourself out. Build me that house. I willingly accept it. You see, David was a man that understood his place. He knew he was not God, and he knew that God was God. See, when children misunderstand their role within the family, that's when things get all whopper-jawed. That's when things get all messed up. But when children understand their proper place, oh, that's when things flow, and that's where parents are able to bless, and parents are able to demonstrate their love to their child in positive kinds of ways. And this was the secret to David, that David never lost sight of who he was, and just his constant aim of prayer.
is seeing God as God and seeing himself as he was. And so we need to be praying, oh Lord, help me to remember who I am and help me to remember who you are and oh Father, bless my life. And Father, we ask that Lord, you would continue to work in our hearts that there would be on a daily basis an understanding that would come to us of who you are and who we are, that we would understand what our role is, and we would comprehend what your role is, and we would never confuse the two. That we would continue to exalt you as God, that we would be dependent upon you. You don't need us, but oh, Father, how we need you. And so, Lord, would you create just a constant dependence on our part of just looking to you and, Father, praying in all circumstances and seeking direction from you. And, Lord, as we see all of the precious promises that are ours in Christ Jesus, may we, like David, be found this week saying yes and amen And oh God, bless our lives for your glory. And Father, as you bring success and glory to us, may you be the one we are making great. For we are, we pray these things in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen.